welcome to Grace Lutheran Church and School. It is very nice uh, to have all of you here with us today as we kick off National Lutheran Schools Week. It's also the third Sunday of Epiphany. I'll explain what Epiphany means uh, during the actual message this morning because it's a, a cool time of the year. It really is, in my opinion. Uh, if you're visiting with us today for the first time or you haven't had a chance to do it yet, Please take a moment to fill out a visitor card in the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center is an area that we just came through. And after the service today, we're also going to have coffee uh, and some donuts. And one of the reasons we're doing that is it is the start of National Lutheran Schools Week. Making Disciples for Life is our theme, if you will, for this year. Hopefully you received a bulletin when you came in, because that's going to have what you need. Uh, for the service. We also have a book fair at the start of the week, and it goes throughout the week, but that's open to everyone, so that's not just restricted uh, to school. Mrs. Bennett's will be there. It's in the art room slash library. That's the room directly adjacent uh, to our fellowship hall cafe. So every, if you notice, every room here has kind of, this is the only room that doesn't have too many rooms to it. Uh, because we do so many things that our rooms get used for multi-purposes. We will be having a special voters meeting after today's service. This is very exciting. Uh, the purpose for this is to extend a call for an organist director of instrumental music and then also to request a vicar. Uh, that would be a, you know, we've had the deaconess interns the last two years. <coughs> Vicars would be um, students who are preparing for the pastoral ministry. So this typically would be their third year of a four-year program. They'd come to us for a true internship. It wouldn't be a case where they would be coming back afterwards. Uh, but it gives us the opportunity to train a person for service in the church. Uh, and also to have another person to work with our, mainly our middle school scholars. So uh, very excited about that possibility. Materials about the voters meeting will be in the Welcome Center immediately after today's <coughs> service. Our board for mission outreach is gathering certain items for the food pantry at Trinity Lutheran downtown St. Pete. There's a flyer about that in the Welcome Center. Finally, everything that you are going to need for this morning's service is in that bulletin uh, that you received when you came in. I know it's a fairly large pamphlet. The surface itself it is actually not that long. Don't let it scare you. It moves along very quickly. I wouldn't anticipate we'd be much more than uh, an hour here, even with the number of people and our scholars uh, that are going to be singing for us a couple of times during the service. One last thing. The bells are going to ring three times. They'll call to mind our baptism into Christ. We will then stand and face the rear of the church. We do have a processional cross today. Uh, so the cross etiquette is you look at the cross. That's where Christ's presence is as he comes in for us. <coughs> as it processes past you, uh, it will go up here. Uh, you'll then follow the regular order of service. At the end, it will recess. You'll follow it with your eyes out, but you turn to the front ones at these. And you'll have to excuse my cough. A lot of you know, uh, I was pretty sick last week, and I really am fine. But like a lot of people who had that head cold, I just had a little lingering uh, congestion. No fever, no contagious, no, I tested for everything under the sun. No nothing. Thanks to God for that. All right. The bells are going to ring three times to call to mind our baptism in Christ. After that, we will stand and face the rear of the church. The epistle reading is from Colossians chapter 1. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there are no divisions among you, but that you are united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people 
that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of one of you says, I will follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I was baptized. I baptized none of you except Christus and Gaius. So that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be empty of its power. For the Lord of the, the word of the Christ is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord.
may be seated, parents or grandparents, you may pick up your style. God. 
We created the line not E, and when we did, the ultimate separator, death, entered into the mix. On our own, there's no way for us to cross the line, and even if we could, we die instantly. For no sinner may see God in his full glory and live. The line is there for our sake, you see. God is just that way, that he works good in all things for those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And so since there's a line, he sent his son to straddle it. His divinity failed or hidden on our side, so that by his straddling, he might become the bridge back to a relationship with his Father in heaven. Consider the Gospel for today and how it subtly serves this purpose. Here's how it started. <coughs> When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Talk about ordinary. On the surface, that's just what this seems. A few throwaway verses to set the stage for the real stuff that was about to come next. But I can assure you that nothing could be more real than these places. For starters, many of us know and dearly love someone who grew up there. And while she didn't do it in the first century, Deaconess Bay is a great reminder that real people live and still do live in the places mentioned in our gospel. <coughs> Further still, these places were on the border between Israel and the nations, the line, as it were, between the people of God and those on the outside looking in. As Matthew's quotation from Isaiah explained, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death on them, a light is dawn. The Epiphany season starts on the festival day itself. As the Magi were drawn to the Christ child by the light of a star. Now, some 30 years later, that child fully grown and become the great light <coughs> that God always intended from the foundation of the world. Isaiah's writing and Matthew's citation of it are brilliant in that. They put the words darkness and light, and phrase shadow of death and light, right next to one another in the original language sentence structure. Linguistically, the light of Christ envelops darkness and calms the fear of death that separates people from God who created them. What is more, in these few verses, he's straddling the line between God's people and the nations as well, even as at his birth. <coughs> he began to straddle the line between heaven and earth. Already in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us a message of reconciliation. The next few verses in Matthew make exactly this point as Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then to assemble his team of apostles by calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John. 
went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now, I don't know about you, and maybe you don't know anything about this whatsoever, but a few of you no doubt do. <coughs> I've always been one who's bought into the notion that scholars say that Matthew was somehow the Jewish gospel. Indeed, it's only in Matthew that we learn that Jesus once said to a poor woman begging for her daughter's life, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. True, of course, because Jesus said it. Which means, too, that Israel, as he used it here, must be defined as something other than a tiny little nation under Roman occupation. In fact, the places where Jesus was visiting and working miracles would hardly be defined as Israel if we were using political boundaries. <laughs> But even if we were, the people who Jesus chose to minister to and heal were hardly the ones that first century Jewish leaders would have chosen first. These people, the demon possessed, the epileptics and paralytics, were outsiders. And yet Jesus chose to go to them and heal them first. This model is extremely important for those of us who are gathered here today. Extremely important for me and for you. You see, what these people had in common other than their sinful nature is that they could do nothing for themselves. Their ailments had robbed them of their faculties. They were utterly helpless in a society that was called, called to be helpful for them and was not. It begs two questions for you to ask yourself today. First, how helpful are you for your neighbor? and particularly your neighbor that is marginal and outcast. From the unborn to the struggling single parent, to the disabled, to the lonely, to the mourning, to those who are in the greatest of need. How helpful are you for them? Second, do you see yourself as self-sufficient before God? Or as a person who's in need of help? The answer to the first question, I fear, should be an obvious, not so much. And I'm going to do something very unusual for me, and that I'm going to use myself to start as a somewhat positive example. I, I'm one who's always taken very seriously God's command to care for the widow and the orphan and be careful what you pray for because you're going to get it. In part, it was for that reason that I fostered over two dozen children along with my wife as I was able. And people praised me for that. Yet I'm constantly reminded of how far short I fell in regards to being helpful, even though I seem to be a mom. For example, because of my sinfulness, I've aged out of that. I can't do it anymore. Aches, pains, those things are a reminder of that which plagues us. And honestly, in a moment of true confession, even when I served, it wasn't always an altruistic, sacrificial thing for the child's sake. Rather than being praised, 
I should have been told, nice try, come back when you're really ready to do this, which would have been never. You see, I get angry and pout about the loss of personal freedom that foster children created. I constantly complain to and about social workers and the system, always seeing the little speck there in their eye while all the while failing to address the logs that were in my own. Lord, have mercy on me, a poor, miserable sinner. So yes, I think it is very safe to say that all of us sin and fall short in regards to perfectly helping our neighbor as God requires. Worse though, far worse because it is eternal life threatening, is our failure to see that we need help from God. That he alone is the one who stands there straddling the line, reaching out a bloodstained hand to pull us across the safety. Lots of times you fail in your need to seek help because you fail in your ability to see your sin and repent of it. The devil really is that tricky. And, and so it was for that reason that Jesus had to stop straddling the line and come all the way across into our mess. Your mess. My mess. That is this world of sin. Once here, he was all in until he handled the greatest mess of all. Death. Even death on the cross. In the moment that he breathed his last, all light was extinguished. As from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, that's noon to three, darkness covered the land. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Once he was removed from it, the world went. Felt or not, 
You desperately need the forgiveness that Jesus offers here. And just as desperately, your neighbor is in need of that same forgiveness. By God's grace, your light, the reflected light, lights the way. Guess what? In Christ, you are an epiphany. Not that you're divine, but rather that by virtue of your baptism into Jesus, you bear his image. All for the sake of others in their need. Well, what could be better than that? May the God of all grace continue to strengthen you for that good work which he has prepared in advance for you to do. A good work carried out each and every day at Grace Lutheran School. Go Wildcats! <laughs> Praise be the holy name of Jesus forever. Please stand out and join with me in praising God by confessing his name in the words of the nice scene that you read. I believe. Move those who are elected in our land to serve according to your will and ways, 
always in regard to the unborn, the widow, the orphan, and all those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy God, your Son welcomed the sick, the afflicted, and those oppressed by demons and heal them. Have mercy upon all whom we bring before you in prayer, especially Steve, Joe, Jennifer, Jackie, Heather, and Lisa, Paul, Navitha, Carl, Maka, Joyce, Reggie, Barbara, Jim, Dennis, Tony, Joanne, Jean, Paul, Mary, Gary, Clarence, Chris, Susan, Ed, Keith, Pat, Ebony, David, Anita, Barbara, Donna, Katarina, Helen, Paul, Robert, Abby, the Anderson, and the Nobody families, and those who we might name silently before you in our hearts. Deliver that according to your gracious will, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, your kingdom is at hand whenever Jesus our King, or wherever Jesus our King dwells. Bless those who receive your Holy Supper today, that they may rejoice that the King draws near with his body and blood for their salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.